I'm John Murray. I'm the founder of Spatia AI, and I'm also a visiting professor in the Geographic Data Science Lab at the University of Liverpool in Northwest England. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to use Apache Arrow with number CUDA kernels to generate AI workflows. As background, the talk is based on our recently published academic paper, Estimating Generalized Measures of Local Neighborhood Context from Multispectral Satellite Images Using a Convolutional Neural Network, which was recently published. To put that into more English, it is we actually used an autoencoder neural network to, to attempt to classify neighborhoods with unsupervised classification from satellite imagery. So just as some background, I'll show you the other tools that uh, I used in the process. The first one is number JIT, that's just in time, high performance Python compiler. This actually will take your Python code and compile it. So it gives you the advantage and the speed of writing in Python while giving you the execution speed and parallelism of writing in C. It's fully compatible with NumPy and CuPy. It has memory management, which you can use for managing GPU and uh, CPU arrays. It also has export support, which is experimental for compiled Python classes, typed Python lists, typed Python dictionaries. And there's a link on the screen if you want to go and find out more. The other tool that I used is CuPy, which is a GPU accelerated array library for Python. It's NumPy and SciPy compatible, and it provides, again, memory management. It allows you to write your own custom functions, and there's a link on the screen if you want to go and find more. So I'm gonna give some background to our project. We're working with satellite imagery. Therefore, coordinates are key to the success of it. So the world actually has this World Geodetic System 1984, which was developed in the United States, of latitude and longitude. This uh, basically splits the world uh, north to south into rings and into bands around the equator. So you have a latitude band uh, or a longitude varies from north at Greenwich to 180 degrees east and west. So this is a different coordinate system. This is looking at the Earth as a spheroid. So you actually have a spheroid model. The Earth is actually not a perfect sphere. It's actually fatter in the middle than it is north to south. So one of the things they do is the um, UTM system, which is the Universal Transverse Mercator, and the US MGRS, that's Military Grid Reference System, are used to create flat Earth zones. So they approximate a flat portion of the Earth across a zone. Now, this was originally used by the US military but it is now used for satellite imagery by NASA and the European Space Agency. So you split your, the Earth is split up into 60 zones uh, of uh, longitude and then the zones of uh, lettered zone of latitude up the top. And you have standard X, Y coordinates within the zone because they're small enough to minimize the distortion. So within that, they have uh, the each then uh, zone is divided up into tiles so these are mgrs tiles these are again originally with a military purpose now used uh, extensively for annotating satellite data in the in great britain we have the british national grid this is a 200 year old coordinate system that uses an out-of-date spheroid model the airy ellipsoid this was a, from about 1826 in the US, um, you had a similar system, which is the old Clark ellipsoid. And in, in the United States, there is a system called NADCON, which is North American Datum Conversion, which does a similar thing. But it's basically converting an old coordinate system into a new. And the way that's done is through interpolation. So having given that background, I'm going to show you how to create a machine learning ready tensor set from satellite imagery using coordinates held in an arrow table. So I'm going to be using the number and CUPI tools 
to work beyond Arrow, because Arrow is concerned mainly with tabular data. We have tabular data in here, but we've also got imagery. We're generating some binary data for the tensor set. So we have a variety of different types of data set we need to work, work together with. Excuse me, I'm going to restart that. I'm just... So today I'm going to show you how to create a machine learning ready tensor set from satellite imagery using coordinates that are held in an arrow table. Now we're going to work beyond tabular data because arrow is primarily concerned with tabular data, but we've got imagery as well. And we need to work with that imagery. And we also need to uh, bring in some uh, ten, uh, binary numeric data in CuPy, and we need to generate some data set that is compatible with TensorFlow in order to take forward our machine learning. So one of the things we have to do when we're converting between coordinate systems is it's actually the maths is very complicated. So this is when you're converting between universal transverse Mercator and latitude longitude both ways. It's actually what's called a Gauss-Kruger series. It is splitting the coordinates into real and imaginary components, so i.e. complex numbers, and then iteratively solving a set of equations on them, and they're sixth order differential equations. Um, this is intensely computational. Um, in pure Python, running this function on one million on a top end CPU takes about 30 seconds. So when we're looking at some of the large satellite data sets, a typical one will have about half a billion data points, and we're trying to run this. That's four hours, so it's no good to us. We need something faster. So we're looking at how can we accelerate this. So just a little bit of background what we're, to what we're working with. We're working with satellite imagery. This is from the European Space Agency and the European Union's Copernicus Sentinel mission. Now, the Sentinel-2 are a pair of satellites that take multispectral satellite imagery. They've got 12 bands. So they capture the RGB, the red, green, blue, as you'd expect. And that's a satellite image of Chester, where I live in northwest England. But they also capture um, eight, uh, they capture eight um, non-visible bands. And these are, you can see these here. This is the infrared band, the near infrared. They actually capture quite a range of infrared from high to me medium, high and low. And they also capture UV at the other end. And the reason they do these is they're very sensitive to water and vegetation. So if you're wanting to see how vegetation's going, how water density is, you can use it to, you can use a non-visible one. Similarly, with air quality, they can measure aerosol so what we need to do is what we're trying to do is to put, is to actually classify neighborhoods. Therefore, a neighborhood in the UK, we define as typically a postcode. So postcode on average is around 14 households. So we actually have a coordinate of the center of the um, neighborhood. So what we want to do is to be able to go into our uh, satellite imagery and crop an area around those coordinates and they will form our tensor set for the deep learning. So we can see we've actually preloaded there. We've got a set of satellite images. We've got some very different images. We've worked here to find the most cloud free within an optimal time zone around the points of interest that we are. So we're cropping around points of interest. So this is tabular data. This is the Office of National Statistics, which is the equivalent of the Census Bureau in the United Kingdom. And they publish this ONSPD, ONS Postcode Directory, where they give the coordinates. But they give them in British National Grid. So we've actually had to do some very computationally intensive processing that I just showed you to convert and generate UTM coordinates. So we can see there the output of that process. So we've generated our UTM process. So this has been pre-processed. So then what we need to do is how many manifests, because the, the term used in the satellite imagery for a collection of images that were 
temporally um, captured, which is the whole range of the multispectral, is called a manifest. So we've actually in that, what I want to do is do a group by period. So I'm using DuckDB uh, on top of the arrow table to get a collection of manifests. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a minute. I just want a, a set of unique manifests. There are other ways I could do this. I could do this with um, the unique function in arrow, um, but I, I, I want it sorted as well. And it's actually I, writing, being able to write SQL on arrow tables is actually quite straightforward and it's quite readable. So then what we need to do is to write some functions and these are written in number uh, and they're written to run with CuPy. So they're running with got GPU acceleration. So we're going to do the image processing on the GPU with CuPy. So what we need to do as we process each one is we need to read the image. We need to extract the bands within the image and convert them into numeric arrays and when we've done that we can generate the tens but there's some processing that we need to do to that because the light levels vary on the capture and what we want to do is have consistent light levels so we use a technique that's commonly used in video photography called white balancing so that white balances the image so that is within that and that's being run through the thresholds it looks at the um, range so the core um, the standard deviations so it's 99.5 percentile and then it corrects the bands this is a very very common in a lot of processing your, your mobile phone camera will typically do that so then what we also need to do is having uh, processed our image we then need to crop it and generate tensors so what we're doing here is we've written a, a, a quite simple, it's not a very long function, but what we're going to do is we need to convert the coordinates, the actual ground coordinates, into pixel coordinates to go and get the part of the image that we want to crop. And the way we do that is if we can see what's passed to this function, we're passing the easting and northing coordinates, we pass the origin as a tuple, we pass the scale, so that's the pixel size in meters, and the size, size of the image, the number of channels, because it's multispectral. And then we, we put past a sequence number. Now, the sequence numbers are so that we can match back. If you notice when I loaded it, I had a sequence number. This enables us to create a one-to-one -one relationship between the image array and the arrow table in running our number tables so then what we do is what we're we're going to create we've loaded our arrow table so we just use the length of that as an argument we're going to create a cuda mapped array now what a mapped array is is a array that is in shared memory it is shared between the gpu and cpu the big advantage of it is that it both numpy can read it on the cpu and the uh, GPU can read it as if it was a GPU array. Because it's in main RAM, actually physically, it is slightly slower than a native CUDA array. However, you don't have to transfer data to and from host. So you do save with that. And it's also a lot more convenient. Uh, and the biggest advantage is that Arrow deals with them as zero copy as well. So we can work with something that is compatible with NumPy, CPU, um, GPy, CuPy, GPU, and Arrow. And we can interoperate between those. So what we're gonna do is, you've seen earlier, I generated the list of manifests. What I need to do is just go through, is loop through that list and then populate the tensor array. So I'm, I'm looping through those lists, um, and this is incredibly fast. We're seeing for each one, there's 112 manifests. It's taking 133 milliseconds to run the query um, in DuckDB, the, uh, and do the thresholds here of the white balancing. So it's actually doing the white balancing, the query, and generating the tensor set. So it is incredibly fast. It just does it in a, in a couple of minutes. That's including the I.O. So end result, we have a tensor array that we can pass straight to TensorFlow or TensorRT if we're doing inference rather than training. 
But basically, what I've just shown you there is a complete, simple, end-to-end -end from acquisition, tabular data, uh, imagery alongside. You could also do uh, this with uh, supervised learning, although our application is unsupervised, we're using the coordinates. If you actually have labels within your uh, arrow array, you could put them into the uh, DuckDB query and you could create a label array just as easily. And because within Arrow and within DuckDB, there are sampling methods, you could actually balance your data set if you wanted. So you could randomize. So you make sure that there's an equal number in each category. So all the tools exist. And, and I don't need to do anything to this array. I can just save it uh, as an NPZ NumPy array, and I can read it straight into TensorFlow. It's that fast. So this is basically just a, a an overview of our model architecture just for reference. If obviously, the, it's outside the scope of this talk, but uh, I've given a link to our paper if you want to find out more to the background of the entire project. But it's basically a classic autoencoder. And what we're interested in doing is clustering satellites. So we actually compress the image. The latent representation represents the um, summary of the neighborhood image. So that's actually what we're clustering. So we're actually looking for um, can you say these neighborhoods look similar? So then once you've done that, that is ready. It just goes straight into TensorFlow. There is no preloading. So we have generated using Arrow and a couple of uh, custom uh, number functions, TensorFlow ready data that is quick and fast. Uh, there's 1.7 million arrays there. We've loaded them in 28 seconds into TensorFlow. So we can, we can then run our training um we're getting very good accuracy when we do it so then we can actually uh tensor rt which i'm a big fan of is very good for inference so having built your model and you're getting satellite imagery all the time new images and new data you want to be able to run the model on those so we can run tensor rt again exactly the same process we can run that directly to tensor rt so we're going to run our data into tensor rt and uh, tensor rt then develops the graph generate the output and this is real time that is showing you how fast tensor rt is running we're running 1.7 million in just three seconds um so and then just to make sure that our model has worked we actually run the check that the tensor rt results agree with the tensorflow results with the assert all close and we find that, yes, there is this very small difference, but we'd expect that because they are slightly different floating points, never equal. But the differences are quite within a tolerable range. So this is actually the results of our model mapped on Liverpool's city centre. You can see what each dot represents is the centre of the neighbourhood. And each colour, each say the same colour, it classifies similar. So you can see it's classified the large buildings in the city centre are similar. It's classified the terraced houses. And as you get out into the suburbs and you've got larger houses and leafy avenues, you can see that it's classified those very well. So it is actually, uh, it's work, and there's been no training labels on this. This is just saying group things together that look alike. So this is true end to end. We process the source data. We generated the tensors. We've trained the model, we've run inference on the model, we've clustered the output, and we've deployed it. And that is all done in Tensor RT and uh, the entire Arrow ecosystem. So this is run as a production job. So I was just showing on a fairly small data set, which was 1.7 million, which is the uh, postcodes, neighborhoods. But what happens, can we scale this up? How easy does it scale up? So I'm loading this data set called OS. Ordnance Survey is the mapping agency in Great Britain. So they have this data set called OpenToid. TOID actually is a acronym for topographical ID. So that represents the coordinates of every building or infrastructure object. So that's a road or it may be a, a phone booth or um, a post box, it's, it's anything that is infrastructure or building related. And there are half a billion of these. So what we actually have to do, this data set's slightly different in that 
we don't have the latitude longitude fields in this so we have to convert them compute them ourselves so the way we're converting the old ellipsoid is we have to use interpolation so ordnance survey provided an interpolation grid this is very similar to the united states nadcon the process is identical and so we load that into the gpu so we've got this array now loaded where we need to run the bilinear interpolation so then we run uh, so we load our open toy table and we load just short of half a billion. So we've got some coordinates. We've got Eastings and Northings uh, for Great Britain. And we've got our source products. So we need to be able to apply the coordinate transformation grid with interpolation. So we have a custom uh, number function which runs on both. This will run on both CPU and GPU with no modification. Sorry, I'm going to restart. I'm going to restart. Now we need to apply the custom transformation grid. So this is a, I'm going to start again. Sorry, take two. Now we're going to apply the coordinate transformation grid. This is a number device function which can operate on either CPU or GPU, which applies um linear interpolation by linear so it's both directions to any point given that reference grid so we're applying simple but there's quite a lot of point we've got to apply this to half a billion points so we've also having done that when we have applied it we then have to convert to spherical coordinates using the uk um system so we actually then have to calculate a meridional arc, which is approximately where is the meridian of our coordinate system. Uh, and that's uh, an iterative thing, as you can see in the function below. Uh, it's incredible. There's a lot of trigonometry in there. So again, it's computationally intensive. So we're going to run this on the GPU as well. So what we actually do then is we create, we use the length of our open toy table to create some CUDA mapped arrays. So a great pair of mapped arrays. So these mapped arrays are half a billion rows, they're FP64s. So we actually then populate them. And the nice thing is that uh, with Arrow, we can just do an assignment to actually copy the data into our GPU array. We don't have to do any copy to host or anything like that. We just do a simple assignment. So we've, we've got that half a billion re GPU ready, uh, creating the arrays in under 10 seconds. So then we create, we need to create a couple of empty arrays to hold the latitude and longitude that we're about to compute. And then we run it. Half a billion takes less than a second. So we've calculated um, that intensive maths on half a billion points in under a second. And the nice thing is, as I said earlier, that uh, the uh, number mapped arrays are directly compatible and zero copy with Arrow. So all we need to do is basically append those columns to our table so we haven't had to do anything else so it's 949 microseconds it's zero copy and there's the result you can see our arrow table has latitude and longitude attached so now what we want need to do to if we want to generate crop satellite imagery around this is to create utm fields now we're creating two utm zones because there is some overlap on the satellite images because at zonal boundaries they overlap so your point of interest might be in the neighboring zone uh, in terms of the way that because all of them are the sentinel ones are 110 kilometers square so that 110 kilometer around may actually span a boundary and it can span it by quite a long way so we need to do that so we actually have two utm zones so we basically we're calculating UTM twice, so we're actually doing this a billion times. And it only took 1.54 seconds to run the Gauss Kruger. So, and, and then we can just zero copy those to the um, output table. And there's our result. So that is ready now for tensor generation. So, yes, it does scale and it scales very fast. So, for background, um just a bit of a couple of references so these are the first two are the papers that i've referred to in developing the work the third one is our uh, recently published paper which you may want to ring if, read if you want to know more about this work but um thank you very much